Okay, um, everybody's here. All right, so um, Mr. Harville, you're up. If it pleases the court, this is Brian Harvell. I represent the appellant in this case, and uh, I would like to, uh, I'm with the firm of Resnick and Lewis, and I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe succinctly stated the issue here is that the trial court erred in denying the motion to compel the arbitration because the federal controlling law applied to the arbitration agreement terms clearly compels the arbitration. And I think that I'm going to, you know, the roadmap to my argument is vaguely as follows. First of all, I want to talk about the law that controls, apply it. And then secondly, I'm going to apply it to the agreement and the terms that are operative here and explain why it compels the arbitration. And lastly, although it is not necessary to be decided here, I am going to talk a little bit about the underlying substance of issues of, as to whether or not there is a, an effective release or some sort of third party beneficiary uh, involved on the substance of the claim as opposed to just the question of whether these issues are arbitrate are subject to arbitration in the first place. So Mr. back Harvell, to- Actually, the, the biggest issue that I have in this case um, is how you can have this, this other mother who's not the mother of the child sign any type of agreement that in any way is binding to this child or this child's parents not just with regard to the arbitration issue, but just generally. Uh, I mean, how did, I, I don't know where any, anywhere in the law that would allow you to do that. Um, I believe that if there is a question as to the effectiveness of that um, signature, that would also be subject to the arbitration. I think that's a question that the arbitrator should be uh, uh, addressing because the terms of the uh, agreement itself delegates all issues including whether there's an agreement or whether it's arbitratable to arbitration. And I- Well, okay, that's great. But how does Miss Flutie basically commit this child who is not her child to anything by virtue of this agreement? To, to I think different sets of facts, I think control your question. The first of all is that it, Mrs. Flutie's uh, signature on behalf of the minor isn't the only document we have. Well, I understand you make the argument about these previous documents, except for all of them in and of themselves say they supersede any previous documents. And the fact of the matter is because uh, this child's mother may have signed a previous document on a previous occasion has nothing to do with this incident this day or this occasion. So, so help me understand that. There is evidence that clearly a the natural guardian, the mother of this minor knew that the minor was being uh, taken to this facility. She knew that they, it was going with a non-guardian who was the custodial uh, party, Miss Flutie. And she knew that the agreement would have to be signed for the child to participate. And un under those facts, it, it, there's really no construction of those facts, which would say that the mother did not consent to all of those arrangements. Well, I think you're trying to make an apparent authority argument, but what's not included in those facts and that evidence is that um, that um, your client had any knowledge of any of that. In other words, in other words, uh, this child's mother did not basically convey to your client that it's perfectly okay for this lady to sign for us. That never happened. Ms. Flutie, in her uh, signing the documents, made that express representation that she had the express permission and implied. Well, permission. but that's that's different. <laughs> this child's mother didn't make that representation. Well, but when okay. you're talking about and that's you got to have that piece for any argument on apparent authority to exist. I'm not so sure why that is. If the apparent authority is really from the perspective of the appellant, um, right? They're the ones who are entitled to rely upon the appearance of that authority, the, the apparentness of that authority. But, but the authority would flow from this child's mother and this child's mother did not do anything to convey that to your clients. I'm not so sure, then it wouldn't be really apparent authority, would it? That would be direct authority because the mother would have said, here is the authority. And, and I don't think that's the same thing as apparent Mr. authority. Mr. Harville, isn't, isn't the, I, I mean, I think the, um, the trial court in analogizing this type of case to the nursing home cases um, was was somewhat on point here 
because your client agreed that there was no need for an evidentiary hearing, although it was offered up a number of times. And I think it probably would have helped in the situation. But the, the real issue, I guess, that I'm trying to grapple with is whether or not Ms. Flutie had the legal consent. And I think that's what Judge Morris was getting at as well, that how could this Ms. Flutie have the legal consent? And that's not an issue that should be for the arbitrator to decide. That's why in nursing home cases, those types of issues are decided by the trial court because you can't just assume because there's an arbitration clause that every issue is decided by the arbitrator. And here we have someone who is not a, nat a parent or a natural guardian signing. Therefore, that should have been right for an evidentiary issue and, and all the things that Judge Morris is asking you, those are factual issues that would have eventually come out of an evidentiary hearing. But again, your client said, no, we don't need one. And so I kind of look at this as, well, then you've waived any right to argue some of those facts. Uh, the, the facts in the, this record, I don't think are that present any contrary position. I don't think there's anything in the record that indicates that the mother didn't know the child was going to go to this facility, didn't know she was going to this facility with Ms. Flutie. But the dilemma, this. but the, there's a disconnect though. Yes, the mother knew all of that, but how did the mother authorize? You're, you're saying that we should just, in, by some sort of inference here, whatever the mother knew, subject it to Ms. Flutie, but there was, there's no communication between the two of them that that's indeed what she had. And even if she did that with the, the, the statute as far as consent by a parent or a natural guardian, we still don't get there. Uh, you know, I think that it comes down to the apparent authority argument. I, you guys seem to be pressing me for evidence of direct authority where we I could show some sort of intention. No, on I don't think that's accurate at all. I mean, there has to be some sort of evidence that this mother in some way conferred the authority on Miss Flutie to act for her child. And you and don't think, have any of that. Well, except for the fact that she consented to Miss Flutie taking her child to the uh, facility. She consented not the to same her thing though. <laughs> you know. Well, but why isn't it? I mean, it's a parent authority. She's saying you can take my child, you can take them to Urban Air, you can sign the agreement that I'm familiar with. Well, you're jumping kind of you just jumped into that fact with absolutely nothing to support it. That she said, fine, take my child to this amusement park, but where in there is there any sort of communication? And, and yes, you now have the authority to sign for me. And more importantly, it's what she conveys to your client. In other words, some sort of action, some sort of course of dealing, some sort of acquiescence or indicator of knowledge that this is going to go on. You have zero. You have nothing. And that's well, what apparent than, authority is. Other than the uh, arbitration uh, agreement, sorry, other than the agreement signed by Ms. Flutie, which indicates she does have actual and implied authority and apparent authority. And to me, when you're in my client's shoes. Well, it may be fraud on Ms. Flutie's part, but it doesn't get you where you're trying to go. Well, I mean, I think that you guys uh, obviously have a point of view on this. I, I can speak to it and, and I can't, but I can't change the facts. The facts that well, I have that well, demonstrate- Our job is to read your briefs and come prepared to, to argue, you know, discuss it with you. Listen Absolutely, yeah. No, that, that was yeah. not even an implicit criticism. I just, you know, I've done this enough to know that if you're, you're not going to convince judges to change their mind, you know, you know when you get to know, stop. Um, and, and I don't want to, to believe the points because really it is a, the, the universe of facts that could give to the uh, could lead this court to conclude that there was sufficient authority, apparent or otherwise, are known, and those are not compelling to you apparently. But we know that the the mother gave permission to Miss Flutie to take this child to this facility. We know that she knew that there was going to be a contract signed, there was going to be an agreement signed because she signed it before, and she knew that it was going to be signed by Miss Flutie, and that. You know, when the um, when you look at the case law, there is case law that indicates that when a uh, a non party signs the agreement on behalf of the third party beneficiary, it is binding and, and can be applied in that circumstance. And here, you know, I think we've satisfied that that hurdle. We've overcome that hurdle. Uh, and I cannot produce a note from the, the natural sorry from the mother to the non custodial guardian saying. Um, you know, show this to Urban Air, show them that I have given you 
delegated some authority to you, so on and so forth. I can't do that. But I, I can point to the set of facts that there are not contradicted at all in terms of allowing the child to go with Miss Flutie, knowing what she was going to be signing on behalf of the child to participate and doing so as the purpose of a third party beneficiary to the child and representing expressly it, that she had the authority of the natural mother of the guard uh, uh, as the non-custodial guardian. And so, you know, if you guys are not convinced that those sets of facts are uh, sufficient to establish the apparent authority, I'm going to have my work cut out for me today, for sure. Um, but I don't understand, since there is no factual, there's no counterfacts to our uh, narrative as to how this unfolded. There's really no disagreement at all on that. And uh, it really raises, how it raises this question even. You know, I, to me, the issue um, is the way you guys are, presenting it is, is apparent authority ever enough in these circumstances to uh, compel arbitration? Because the questions I'm hearing indicate, well, you don't have any direct evidence that the authority was delegated from the parent to the non-custodial guardian. And my argument back is, well, then that wouldn't be apparent authority. And, you know- Well, Mr. Harville, I think, I think my, my point on this is, um, by rejecting an evidentiary, I think you, you may very well have gotten there by an evidentiary hearing to develop those additional facts that you're relying on that we're asking about. My issue is without that, we're left with what we have, which is, which are a shorter set of facts. So um, anyway, that, that, that's my issue. And if that is the uh, overriding issue here, my suggestion would be to return this to the court. But, no, but but you all rejected that. That's why I was asking you, you know, I, I think you waived one of the, I, I think it was waived at, at that point because it was not asked for. Um, I don't know that you get two bites at the apple for that. I think you would have the authority to do that. I'm not sure that you want to do that, but I think you, there would be nothing in the law that would prohibit you from doing that. Um, and especially when I, I come back to this point, uh, and I apologize for repeating, but there's no counterfactual narrative. There's nothing to suggest that the mother didn't do these things in terms of knowing that the child was going to Miss Flutie, knowing that Miss Flutie was going to sign the agreement that she ultimately signed, representing that she had actual and apparent authority. You know, the fact that the mother knew that that provision was in there and that Miss Flutie was going to sign it, to me, is a very strong indicia of uh, giving Miss Flutie actual authority to take her child. I mean, is there some suggestion that Miss Flutie was kidnapping the child or that she was acting inconsistently with the mother's wishes? I don't know what you're record. suggesting. What you're suggesting is that a parent at any time can give some sort of um, oral power of attorney to an, to a another adult and waive um, and, and waive all of these rights. Right. And you're suggesting that. I'm saying that it is reasonable for a court to honor a parent authority to give permission for a minor to participate in activities like Urban Air uh, provides. I think that is a legitimate proposition. And then, so really the question is, have we produced a record that would allow this court to conclude that there was sufficient indicia of a parent authority for that purpose? And I really, put it out there multiple times. I don't want to repeat myself. I know you guys can read and all of that. Um, but, you know, I think we have set, a, a, maybe it's a less than fully developed record, but I think we have definitely uh, provided a record on which it would be not unreasonable. And in fact, um, I would say it is more likely than not going to be a, a kind of a record that most courts would look at and say, this passes muster for apparent authority. And I mean, to me, that, that's sort of what this argument is boiling down to is not whether, I mean, on one hand, I think this court acknowledges that apparent authority is an, a, a, is an allowable method for uh, presenting a minor child uh, to uh, you know, participate in activities that have some risks and where there is a signature, a signature on a document that allows that it's not from the actual natural mother or father is that ever enforceable? Is that allowed? And I believe that that is. And I think that that's really, uh, once we as, accept as established that a, a parent authority is a valid method for a parent to grant 
um, permission for their minor child to participate in certain activities. The only question is, does this record support a conclusion uh, under the federal statutes um, compelling arbitration that there is sufficient apparent authority? And if the record here doesn't convince this court that there's apparent authority, I'm gonna have my work cut out for me today. Um, but I believe that it does. And once, if, if this court just for argument's sake, uh, sake would agree that the evidence in the record is sufficient to establish apparent authority, I think really the rest of the analysis falls into place pretty much without any question. And that is that the federal statute and the, the case law on point would compel arbitration because the uh, release, the document itself has a delegation provision in it. And, you Mr. know, Harwell, below, just so you know, you're at 15 and a half minutes now. Oh, you're okay. in your rebuttal time, but it's your time. You use it any way you want to. Sure. I want to make this one point because I think it's important if we're talking about things like waiver and the record below and so on and so forth. The, the case law does require a specific challenge for a uh, delegation provision in an arbitration agreement. Citing to restaurants via stand 255 Southwest 3rd, 382, 384, Florida, 4th DCA in 2018, it found that the party must specifically challenge the delegation provision, not just the arbitration provision itself, or the delegation provision remains enforceable as a matter of law. Best V Education Affiliates, 82 Southwest 3rd, 143, Florida, 4th DCA, 2012, rejected the argument that a delegation provision did not apply because arbit an arbitration agreement was invalid, and finding validity was an issue for the arbitrator because the appellants did not challenge the delegation provision in the complaint or at the hearing. Here, that is what we're facing. And so if there is a waiver below that should really be important to the outcome here today, it is that there was no challenge to the delegation provision being signed without apparent authority, being assigned without any legal authority. It was not challenged specifically at all. And I believe it should be waived and this should be sent to arbitration. I'll reserve for the remainder. Okay. You've got three minutes left when you come back. Thank you. Ms. Norris. Good morning, your honors. Kristen Norris and along with Stuart Markman of Kynes, Markman and Fellman, we represent Ms. Kimberly Barnes individually and on behalf of her child, EJ. Trial court denied Cardin Dean's motion to compel arbitration for one reason. It ruled that no agreement to arbitrate existed between the parties to this litigation because the only agreement that Carter and Dean sought to enforce was an agreement signed by a third person and there was no showing that the person had authority to sign it, sign it and buy it find Ms. Barnes and her child, EJ. So Ms. Norris, can I just digress there? Because that is obviously the key issue in the case. And you've heard your, your opponent, Mr. Harvell, make a pretty decent argument on apparent authority. I didn't think he was sort of had anything persuasive at that point, but his oral argument has convinced me he's got something. And his point is that uh, Ms. Barnes telegraphed to the owner of this amusement park her um, authority delegated to Miss Flutie by virtue of the fact that Miss Barnes had been there before with her child, signed these very agreements, and had to know full well that Miss Flutie would be signing this very agreement as well. So the question is, does does the is the appellant entitled to rely on the previous visits by Miss Barnes, where these agreements were signed? for them to you know, proceed from the assumption that Ms. Flutie had her authority to sign these very agreements, which she know had to be signed for her child to go to this amusement park. So the apparent authority to me, the key is there has to be some evidence that the, that the amusement park owners had that, that, that was conveyed by Ms. Barnes, that it was okay for Ms. Flutie to commit her child. And he's made the argument, the previous trips there is that evidence. What do you think? Okay, let me start with the previous trips there because that all ties into these prior releases. And the prior releases were not presented at the hearing. They were not submitted into evidence or authenticated. They were tacked onto a supplemental memo. And then what the supplemental memo said is it's notable that we have these prior releases, but it made no legal argument on apparent authority or anything related to those prior releases. But in the end, the prior releases suffer from the same problem that they have with what they say they learned at the hearing that Ms. Flutie had authority to bring EJ to the park. And that is, there's no evidence that they knew these things going into the transaction. 
There's, they have to show not only a representation by Ms. Barnes, the representation by Ms. Flutie is irrelevant. They have to show that there's something that Ms. Barnes did or said to them going into the transaction on which they relied and on which they acted. But they did not know any of this. And there's no evidence they knew any of this until after the hearing. After the hearing, they dug up the prior releases at the hearing. They got an acknowledgement that you know she hadn't kidnapped the child but you can't prove reliance based on something that you didn't know at the time. So the apparent authority argument falls because there's just no evidence of authority. And they really couldn't reasonably rely on Ms. Flutie's authority when the law does not allow Ms. Flutie to sign this document. In fact, their own document throughout says this natural guardian has to sign this on behalf of a child and then tag at the very end. But if you're somebody else, you say that you have authority to. The reality is, there is no law, no case, no law that would permit a non-parent to bind a parent and child under a parent. There's no law applying parent agency to this facts. In fact, the law in Florida is that only a parent can bind a child to contracts. And even then the parent's uh, ability to do so is limited. So even Ms. Uh, even Ms. Barnes could not have, have um, waived all the rights in this release, uh, but only Ms. Barnes could have signed a release at all or, or an, another natural guardian. Um, so they are asking you to break new ground. What they want you to do is hold that any time an adult shows up at their park or, or some other place with a child in tow and it doesn't look like the child is kidnapped, then they can presume that that party not only has the authority to bring the child there, but to contract away the rights. And let's talk about what Ms. Barnes know, knew because we don't know what she knew. Uh, you know, not only were these re prior releases not brought to the court's attention and not authenticated until after the hearing, and then were never authenticated, not brought to the attention until the supplemental memo, and then not argued about, but the, the forms themselves say natural guardian, natural guardian, natural guardian. So there's no showing that Ms. Barnes would have known that they would have accepted this from Ms. Flutie, or what her thought process seven months earlier had to do with what Ms. Flutie had authority to do at the time. And unable to show the, 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 uh, not only that the law would allow this, but that apparent agency is shown under the facts of the case. And yes, they consistently said, we don't need evidence. It's their burden, but they said, we don't need evidence. The court offered numerous times to give them an opportunity to have an evidentiary hearing. They said, we don't need it. And Cardi and Dean specifically said that again in their supplemental memo. There's nothing in dispute here. This is what we have. So they've waived any additional hearing on whether or not there's authority or trying to prove authority because they, they said at the, th at the hearing that they did not need that. I wanna briefly address um, the third party beneficiary issue. They have not acknowledged the Mendez case and the Mendez case says you cannot use the third party beneficiary doctrine to bind somebody who did not sign an arbitration agreement to the arbitration agreement. You can use it the opposite way. If you signed an arbitration agreement and part of that agreement acknowledged a third party beneficiary, then that third party beneficiary can invoke that against you because you signed for arbitration and consented to it. But the opposite is not true under the Florida Supreme Court's decision in Mendez. Uh, the, all the other arguments really go to, I mean, they, they made an argument in their brief and I, I think Mr. Harbell started to say that this is an issue uh, for the arbitrator, like whether or not a contract exists and whether or not the person who signed it had authority to do so is an, is an issue for the arbitrator. No, it's not. The Florida law, the Florida Arbitration Code, the Federal Arbitration Code, the Shea case, the Granite Rock case, Florida Supreme Court, US Supreme Court, this court, whether or not you had authority to sign the agreement with the arbitration provision in it and bind the party to litigation is a question of contract formation. It's a question for the court to decide. There is no case holding that you can somehow sever a provision of a contract you can't prove existed and then use it to bind non-parties. Uh, so this was for the arbitrator, this was for the court to decide. The court decided it based on what Carter and Dean said was the only evidence necessary to decide the case. And it properly ruled, like every court has to date, that an, a non-parent cannot bind a parent and a child uh, to a waiver of rights, at, at least without some evidence that would support uh, that authority. And uh, if the court has no further questions, we would ask the court to affirm the order denying arbitration. Thank you, Ms. Norris. Mr. Harvell, you have three minutes. 
I'll make it brief. Uh, you know, I think we, we've really run down the apparent authority question, but referencing the uh, separability or severability issue, you know, I, I do think that we don't want to be confused about that. We, you know, the question of whether or not the um, uh, the uh, there was apparent authority or the signature was valid or the signature was uh, authorized or it was somehow going to bind this third party, I believe under the law is all reserved for the arbitrator to decide. Those aren't waived. And, you know, the arguments that they want to present to try and defeat the substance of claims here, that the release was not effective, that the waiver was not effective, that the arbitration clause itself was not effective, they can all make, they're not going to be deprived of those. They can make all of those arguments in front of the arbitrator and there would be no prejudice here. And so to me, when you're looking at these facts, and you, well, Mr. You, Harville, isn't the prejudice that if they didn't have the authority to sign, then why why would we be sending them to arbitration? I mean, isn't that the prejudice? They, they didn't sign it if they didn't have the authority to do it? I, I mean, I, do, I will confess that the a trial court is the proper body to decide whether there is a written, sorry, that there is the existence of a contract to begin with. And, right. to, the, and to the extent that your question is keen on the, whether the signature is valid or not determines the issue of whether there's a valid, you know, a contract or not. Even uh, I, I understand your point, but yeah, and my, and just because someone says they have the apparent authority doesn't necessarily mean they have the apparent authority. I right? agree. I agree with that as well. But again, I think that's a question for the arbitrator to decide because here there was no challenge uh, to the. Well, no, I think uh, that's at the outset. That's for the trial court to decide. It. Well, but, but why? I mean, you know, well, the, really, I think the only question that the trial court is to decide is whether there is the existence of a contract there or not. Otherwise, because the delegation clause but, exists. But, in then this how document. do you jump over? How do you jump over whether or not that person had the apparent authority to determine whether or not there's a contract? Isn't that like the first step we should be looking at? Which I think is why we're focused on it. I agree. If the trial court had made a decision that was either not a contrary to the facts and was supported by the facts that there was no a contract here. And the reason there was no contract here is because the uh, Miss Flutie uh, and sorry, because the natural mother had not expressed some set of circumstances uh, conveying that to my client that Miss Flutie had apparent authority. Then I think, again, I'm gonna have a very difficult day here. Um, I don't think that's the case, though. I think that the facts are that this court over exceeded its bound its, its authority because it did it basically jumped past the question of apparent authority and, and said, uh, really, this, there's a statute here. Seven. You're out of time, sir. So if you would just wrap okay, up. Okay, right. There's a statute on point that says a release cannot be for a minor cannot be signed. And, and they're basically trying to bootstrap that argument that applies to a release and make it applicable to an agreement to arbitrate. That, that's all. Okay. Thank you both very much. It's well argued, well briefed. We very much appreciate your help with this. Have a good Thank day. Thank you.